2026 is no longer just a target date on SpaceX's timeline. It's the year full reusability finally becomes reality. For the first time, both stages of Starship will return to the launch site, caught mid-air by robotic arms. But here's what changes everything. SpaceX just rolled out radical upgrades to Pad 2's catching system that solved the biggest challenge they faced. New actuators, redesigned hydraulics, shorter arms for faster response. So what makes this different from every previous attempt? And why are engineers now confident this will actually work? Let's dive right in. The journey to this moment started with Falcon 9. SpaceX proved that landing rockets wasn't science fiction, it was engineering. But even that groundbreaking achievement was never the finish line. Falcon 9 only recovers the first stage. The second stage burns up. That's partial reusability, and while it revolutionized the industry, it still throws away tens of millions of dollars on every flight. So what happens when you stop throwing anything away? What happens when both stages come home? That's the question Space SpaceX has been chasing for years, and 2026 is when we finally get the answer. Full reusability with Starship means catching both Super Heavy and the ship itself using Mechazilla's chopstick arms. But there's a critical sequence that must happen first. Before SpaceX can catch the ship, it needs to reach orbit. Flight 13, the first V3 mission, will validate Starship's orbital capability. Only after proving the vehicle can survive the full journey and return safely will SpaceX attempt the catch. That means Flight 14, expected in early 2026, becomes the milestone everyone's waiting for. The first time humanity watches an entire orbital rocket stack get plucked from the sky. But here's the problem. SpaceX engineers have been solving. Catching Super Heavy was hard enough. The booster returns from 70 kilometers up, still carrying significant mass and momentum. When those chopstick arms close around the booster grid fins, they're absorbing tremendous force in an instant. Now multiply that challenge. Starship returns from orbit, hundreds of kilometers up, moving at orbital velocity before re-entry. It's been scorched by plasma, stressed by deceleration forces, and needs millimeter-perfect alignment while still descending. Missed by a few centimeters? You've got a fireball and months of repair work. That's why on December 21st, SpaceX delivered something crucial to Pad 2, a completely redesigned actuator. The component arrived covered in black protective wrapping, but its shape told the whole story. Compared to the original actuator on Pad 1, this new unit features more segments and a noticeably larger end section. What does that mean? Upgraded hydraulic cylinders with significantly more power and control. These cylinders sit between the chopstick carriage and the main arm, performing two critical jobs. First, they drive the horizontal opening and closing motion of the arms. Second, and this is where the upgrade matters most, they absorb and dissipate the massive shock load when a falling rocket suddenly becomes a captured vehicle. Think about what's happening in that split second. A 200-ton ship descending at several meters per second makes contact with the arms. All that kinetic energy must be absorbed smoothly, progressively, without sudden jolts that could crumple the vehicle's catching rails or damage the chopstick structure itself. The old hydraulic system worked for Super Heavy, but Starship demands more, more force capacity, more precision, more responsiveness. SpaceX doesn't do incremental upgrades, they redesign the entire system when the mission requires it. And the actuator upgrade is just one piece of a larger transformation. Remember when Elon Musk criticized the original Pad 1 chopsticks for being too long? That wasn't just about aesthetics. Longer arms mean higher rotational inertia. In physics terms, they're harder to start moving and harder to stop once moving. When you're trying to catch a rocket with millimeter precision, every fraction of a second matters. The new Pad 2 chopsticks are deliberately shorter. Less inertia equals faster response. Lifting, lowering, opening, closing. All of it happens with greater agility. SpaceX later shortened Pad 1's arms too, proving this wasn't theory. It was learned experience driving better design. But even with perfect hardware, there's the human element, or rather, the computational element. How do you program a system to catch something that massive, that fast, with zero margin for error? 
SpaceX compares it to catching a fly with chopsticks, but that metaphor doesn't capture the true scale. A fly weighs milligrams. Starship weighs 200,000 kilograms, even when nearly empty. A fly moves unpredictably. Starship follows a precise trajectory, but arrives after enduring re-entry temperatures above 1,400 degrees Celsius. The catching system must account for thermal expansion, structural flex, wind conditions, and real-time positional data. The arms in the vehicle essentially become a single integrated system for those final seconds. One miscalculation ends in catastrophe. That's the engineering reality SpaceX is solving, and it's why they're taking a two-pad approach. Pad 1 is currently undergoing its own upgrade cycle and could return to service in early 2026, possibly before the rest of Pad 2's infrastructure is complete. But here's what's interesting. Pad 1 and Pad 2 won't be identical. Super Heavy uses one type of catching interface, those hardened grid fin mounts. Starship uses completely different catching rails under its forward flaps. Different interfaces mean different hardware requirements. Different rails, different pins, different alignment systems. Current evidence suggests Pad 2 is being optimized specifically for catching the ship, while Pad 1 continues its proven role catching Super Heavy. Does this mean SpaceX is betting everything on tower catches? Actually, no and that's a crucial detail many people miss. In Florida, SpaceX's Starship plans include drone ship landings, not as a backup plan, but as an operational alternative. Why? Because different missions need different solutions. Tower catches offer unbeatable turnaround speed for high cadence orbital missions. No landing legs, no transport logistics. The vehicle gets caught, inspected, and prepared for the next flight within hours instead of days. But lunar missions? Mars missions. Those need landing legs because there's no Mechazilla tower waiting on the moon. Drone ships let SpaceX test those landing systems while also protecting critical ground infrastructure from potential failures. Flexibility is the strategy, not ideology. Use whatever method makes the mission succeed. But even the most advanced catching system is useless if the pad can't survive the launch itself. And that brings us to the most significant upgrade of all, the flame trench and the completely redesigned orbital launch mount. Pad 1 used a six-legged mount paired with a water-cooled steel plate. After the Flight 1 disaster damaged the pad, SpaceX added the reverse water deluge system, and it worked. Ten launches later, the pad was still functional. But here's what the data revealed. Visible discoloration on that steel plate. Engineers know what discoloration means. Thermal fatigue from repeated heating and cooling cycles. The material is degrading. After just 10 flights spread over two years, the system was already showing age. And SpaceX isn't planning 10 flights per year. They're planning 100, maybe more. The solution? Stop trying to absorb the thrust energy. Redirect it instead. The new flame trench at Pad 2 channels Super Heavy's 9,000 plus tons of thrust away from sensitive systems. Position below ground level, it confines the exhaust plume and prevents it from washing over surrounding infrastructure. But SpaceX didn't just dig a hole. They engineered a complete thermal management system. Small diameter water pipes are integrated directly into the flame bucket geometry embedded in reinforced concrete. During ignition, high pressure water floods the trench, aggressively suppressing both heat and acoustic energy. Multiple deluge tests have already proven this design works. And because Super Heavy generates far more thrust than the ship, SpaceX installed dual flame buckets, one at each end of the trench. Double the capacity, double the protection. Above the trench sits the new orbital launch mount, and it's a completely different philosophy. The old mount was an open framework. The new one looks like a rigid, box-like structure welded directly to the platform. Early speculation suggested it might be mobile for rapid replacement, but SpaceX chose permanence instead. Why? Because rigidity equals precision. A welded mount doesn't shift, doesn't flex unexpectedly, maintains perfect alignment launch after launch. The hold-down clamps have been redesigned. Opening and closing mechanisms improved. Sensitive components shielded from plume impingement. 
Massive external manifolds now dominate the mount's exterior, supporting expanded cooling systems that protect both the pad and the mount itself. Heat management isn't an afterthought anymore. It's a core design feature from day one. Look at the bigger picture, and you see SpaceX preparing for something unprecedented, sustained, high-cadence operations with the world's most powerful rocket. They're not building a launch pad. They're building a spaceport. Pad 1 continues evolving. LC-39A in Florida is getting similar upgrades, existing mount legs demolished, new flame trench under construction. Every facility SpaceX operates is being upgraded to the same standard. Because 2026 isn't just about catching Starship once, it's about catching it dozens of times, hundreds of times, making it routine. So here's what it all comes down to. Every upgrade SpaceX just installed at Pad 2, the redesigned actuators, the shortened chopstick arms, the dual flame buckets, the welded launch mount, they're not preparing for a test. They're preparing for an operation that will repeat over and over again. Because catching Super Heavy was Phase 1. SpaceX has done that successfully. But catching both stages? That's the moment everything changes. When Flight 14 lifts off early next year, and both Super Heavy and Starship return to their respective pads, caught midair by robotic arms within minutes of each other, we're not just witnessing a technical achievement. We're witnessing the exact moment spaceflight stops being expensive and starts being accessible. Full reusability means launch costs drop from hundreds of millions to single-digit millions. It means weekly Starship flights become normal. It means the Moon and Mars stop being distant dreams and become engineering problems we're actively solving. And the timeline? It's not some far-off future anymore. We're talking months, early 2026. SpaceX has the hardware installed. They have the flight manifest planned. The only thing left is execution. And if there's one thing SpaceX has proven over the last decade, it's that they deliver. The era of throwaway rockets is ending. The era of fully reusable spacecraft is beginning, and it starts next year. What do you think? Will Flight 14 nail the dual catch on the first attempt, or will SpaceX need multiple tries to perfect it? Drop your predictions in the comments below. And if you want to stay updated on every development leading up to this historic moment, hit that subscribe button and join the Space Update 24-hour community. We'll be covering every test, every upgrade, and every flight as SpaceX rewrites the rules of spaceflight. See you in the next one. 330 tons of thrust per engine. 33 engines working together. That's 10,890 tons of total liftoff thrust. Three times what NASA's legendary Saturn V could deliver. And here's the part that should worry Blue Origin. This isn't some distant dream.